Greetings, friends. Welcome to the Pin Tool Podcast. My name is Al Wayman, owner of Creek Road Pottery in Laceyville, Pennsylvania, next to the cold Tuscarora Creek. Pull up a chair around the wheel as we discuss topics concerning the art and craft of pottery, good books, storytelling, marketing, and creating work that matters for folks who care. Greetings, friends. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 10 of the Pin Tool Podcast. My name is Al Wayman. And things are going fairly decent here at the beginning of fall. The leaves are changing, turning into beautiful colors up here in northeastern Pennsylvania. And it's been a busy month. I am building work up for two shows. One is the Susquehanna County Artist Tour. And I'm going to be at the Soaring Gardens Artist Retreat up the road. And the fall show that's coming is a week after that. So a month away is my big fall show on the local pumpkin trail. And it's with it with uh, other small local businesses. And that's usually a really fun time. A lot of people come out, do their early Christmas shopping get to see all my neighbors and supporters of the pottery so I did make some major accomplishments I got that big burry box kiln it's all stacked on pallets I got 10 pallets I got to wrap up and prep to have shipped here to the pottery and then the big task will be through the winter cleaning all those bricks and in the spring starting the build of the wood kiln here at Creek Road Pottery, Laceyville, Pennsylvania, which would be which would be really nice. I, I can't wait to, to get on it. I've been looking into uh, a lot of kiln building books and I took the kiln down myself so i seen how things went together took loads and loads of pictures and uh i got really good plans that were given to me uh the blueprints of the kiln so i'm i'm pretty optimistic that things are going to go fine usually usually as a ceramic artist i am pessimistic about everything Uh, i i hope for the best but expect the worst (laughs) and so uh when things come out i'm surprised you know i'm like oh wow that that kiln load of bulls thank goodness actually came out kind of nice speaking of pots i got about 100 drying out in the sun today in bread racks their their little bottoms are pointing upwards and it's a nice drying day it's we got a nice breeze here and the sun is very warm, so it's it's kind of nice here at the beginning of fall. So I'm hoping to get all those pots through the kiln within the next week or so and glazed so that I can have them for the open house weekend on the artist tour. So, lots of busy things happening. And... Uh, I'm trying to keep going. Uh, on top of that, I have been working the paper factory. There's been a lot of crazy stuff happening there. Um, we've got some upgrades, and uh, we were trying to iron that out. So it's still really busy there. It's getting a little bit better. Um, so I have not been as tired when I get home from the 12-hour swing shift, but it makes a guy not want to do all that much. Uh, if he's been working all day. So I've been trying to balance work life. And uh, especially now with the shows. I've been getting up a little bit early to handle some mugs. So I try to do the larger things and the larger processes on my days off. And then the easier things, like handling a few wearboards before work, uh, make it a little bit easier to have things be on time. Need to drop off 
over 20 little pots to have uh, candles made up. I like to do the, the wood wicks and uh, Kathy Taylor, um, a good friend of mine, fills them for me and she, she's a candle person herself. She does an awesome job. So she has her little little candle business there and she does some furniture painting. And uh, so she fills them for me. I just need to drop them off. Maybe, maybe later today or Saturday. Also, I was able to receive the first payment from Amazon Publishing for my journals that I posted. And thanks to everyone who purchased those, uh, My Pottery Projects, My Pottery Journal, and My Pottery Firings. So there's three different journal books on Amazon. And uh, I didn't think anybody would buy them, but <laughs> you did. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a huge check, but it was something saying that uh, there's one or two people out there that enjoyed those. And so I, I thank you for that, and I really appreciate it. They're going to be posted to Amazon, well, as long as, until I take them down. It's uh, Amazon Direct Publishing, so, so that's kind of nice. Also, for this podcast, uh, I've been receiving some great comments back and uh, some emails from you all. And I really appreciate you listening and supporting the Pin Tool Podcast. So today... I would like to talk about the idea of pot design and how important or maybe not important it is. And we're going to get into some ideas around critiquing pots and maybe making better looking pots. I'm not sure how to word this um, because I think that the concept of what is good or not has loosened up um, simply because social media has allowed us to form our own communities on what's good or not and our buyers decide that and we have more of a say in deciding that right so it ends up being the question like what is art and what is good art? What are good pots? And a little bit around that. Because on social media, we don't need to get picked by gatekeepers to have access to communities anymore. We get to pick ourselves. And if we feel that our work is safe enough and functions enough to be able to put out and people... Uh, give you money for them and are willing to give you money for money for them and uh, enjoy them then People are able to form their own communities and not wait to be picked by some gatekeepers or some jury or Keeping your fingers crossed that you get into that That you get into that show you can pick yourself, right? So that's amazing. However, there's another side to it does that mean that all ideas about pottery design and what we thought it was should go out the window. Um, artists who push those boundaries, uh, what about that? So we're gonna we're gonna look at a few things on pottery design and talk about picking yourself and maybe think about what a good pot might be. Because, friends, I have no idea what a good pot might be. And I only know a little bit about what it's not. So, grab a chair and a coffee and meet me right back here outside by the cold Tuscarora Creek on this beautiful fall day. And we'll talk about some things around designing your pots and what makes a good pot what makes a bad pot and other controversial topics around pottery design.
So grab a chair and I'll see you back down here. Greetings, friends. Uh, welcome back. Pull up a chair. And uh, there's plenty of room out here in the big backyard next to the cold Tuscarora Creek in the beautiful fall air. And we're going to talk about designing your pottery. And I wanted to start off by saying I have no idea what a good pot might be. And I only know a little bit about what it is not, right? So I guess a long time ago, way back, people more or less made work for the functionality of it. Um, because the functionality to be used as a tool seemed to be more important, even though at times uh, decoration was put on it. And then as craftsmanship and artistry uh, started to come into play on these forms and elements, more thought went into how the design was done. And so it was thought that maybe there should be some kind of standard set. And those standards are reinforced and broken all the time. So the minute you have a standard, right, there's always somebody pushing the edges. And both of those things are positive things. And we'll get into a little bit about what that is. However, I wanted to say that it may not be good to substitute chance and happy accidents for craftsmanship. And it may not be good to mistake happy accidents and chance for good craftsmanship. So let's get into a little bit about what probably one of the fathers of pottery, uh, Bernard Leach, had to say about it. And in his book, he talked about a need for a standard in his book, A Potter's Book. I have the second edition. I think it's uh, 1967. It's the, the second printing. And on page 11, he talks about that. And I'm going to read a section of that from his book, a potter's book dedicated to all potters. The necessi necessity for a psychological and aesthetic common foundation in any workshop group of a craftsman cannot be exaggerated. If the resulting crafts are to have any vitality, that vitality is the expression of the spirit and culture of the work workers. In the factories, the principal objectives are bound to be sales and dividends and aesthetic considerations must remain secondary. The class of goods may be high and the management considerate and even humanitarian, but neither the creative side of the lives of the workers nor the character of their products as human expression of perfection can be given the same degree of freedom which we rightly expect in handiwork. The essential activity in a factory is the mass production of the sheer necessities of life and the, found, and the function of the hand worker, on the other hand, is more generally human. The problem is made increasingly difficult for that reason that the people who are attracted today by the handcrafters are no longer the simple-minded peasantry who from generation to generation worked in the productive unconscious of tradition, but mainly of self-conscious art students. They come to me year after year from Royal College and Central School and Chamberwell for longer or shorter, usually shorter periods of apprenticeship. As soon as they have picked up enough knowledge or what they think is enough, off they go to start potting on a studio scale for themselves. So, being in a production setting, um, I can relate to that um, in both my work and a little bit here at the pottery. This isn't a full-scale production pottery. I do small-scale production work, maybe runs of 100 or so. But at my job at the paper factory, 
Um, we are making millions and millions of products, all the same, and we stick closely to a rough center line and a rough standard because we need the process to be a known process and the results to be known to be the same way exactly every single time, 99.9% .9 of the times, unless we run into issues. And we're constantly doing quality checks to flag anything that might be out of center line to bring it back into compliance with the standards. So that's expected on a mass production. And bringing those elements a little bit into the pottery here in design work has helped me um, streamline the making process and have it be less expensive, but also it takes away some of the craftsmanship and some of the uniqueness of the work that I'm making, especially on large scale runs. I find that because I don't have time to go in and personally decorate every single pot. Um, I try to do that on a mass scale, which means I can get away with adding interest to the pots in unique ways. By the way, I fire with the gas or by the way, I put the texture patterns on the side of the mugs maybe a hundred so that I did. However, taking more time with say only 10 mugs rather than a hundred uh, brings a whole new unique um, aspect or idea of uniqueness to it. And to me, that's pretty amazing. So I have a problem where if I'm doing quite a bit of work, I, I wonder, I wonder, even though if the pots look good to someone else who may not understand, I wonder if I'm making lazy pots, right, by mass production. And I have to ask myself, what is art? And, is, and am I making good art and using good craftsmanship in what I'm doing to slow it down? And the treadle wheel has helped slow that down a whole lot and helped me think about what I'm making and the forms I'm making more than if I was on electric pumping out a hundred mugs in a day or, or more, right? Some production potters are very quick. However, there can be some beautiful art pieces that are simply made off the wheel hundreds at a time when the original design uh, was artistically done and well proportioned. So, um, that's what Bernard Leach used to do. He used to design pots, have his worker make, workers make them, and the apprentice make them, and then they used to sell them. And they had very strict standards on how those pots were to look. So probably one of the books that I enjoyed most um, on visual basics and, and principles and concepts of drawing and proportion and all of that was a book called Vis uh, Basic Visual Concepts and Principles for Artists, Architects, and Designs. And uh, I'll put the link in the show notes. And this is an amazing book that I got over 25 years ago in drawing class. And I just wanted to read the index of this book because it lays out the basic, uh, not only troubleshooting, but design elements that go into creating form and function and a whole host of things. So in the first one, uh, in the first chapter of this book, it's historical influences on visual education, problem solving, the problem solving process and form generation model, which is an excellent chapter because it takes you through the troubleshooting um, and design of elements and form. And chapter three, drawing as a means of communicating. We make pots as a means of communicating sometimes. Uh, chapter four, formal drawing systems. Chapter five, visual elements of form, point, line, plane, shape. Um, chapter six, volume and structure. Chapter seven, visual and physical attributes of form. Chapter eight, color. So I'm trying to flip the pages here. 
Chapter 9, Depth, Space, Distance. 10, Perception of Figure and Form. Chapter 11, Perceptual Principles of Organization. Chapter 12, Symmetry and Dynamic Symmetry. And they also have a great appendix in here. Um, approaches to creating symmetry compositions and using the golden mean construction and other things. So it's just a wonderful book for troubleshooting and also working with designs and why you would do the things that you do in problem solving of creating work and form. Uh, so one of the things pertaining to pottery in one of the books that I found very helpful is the Functional Pottery, Form and Aesthetic in Pots of Purpose by Robin Hopper. And this was an amazing book and he lists um, a whole bunch of uh, things in here on how to make uh, good work that functions. And I'm just going to read the index of this book. And if you can get a hold of this book, Functional Pottery Form and Aesthetic in Pots of Purpose, by all means, it's, it's a wonderful book. And I read it through. And it's just amazing. So, Chapter 1, Origins. Chapter 2, Functions, Methods, Shapes, and Details. Pots of Purpose. Making Methods. The Development of Shape. Details. Chapter 3, uh, Ethnic Variations and Historical um, Electicism, The Ritual of the Kitchen and the Table. Uh, chapter 4 is Geometry and Universal Symbol, uh, Symbols, Symbols and Geometric Forms. Chapter 5, Forms and Forces, Nature and Growth. Chapter 6, Proportion and Ratio. That was an excellent chapter. Chapter 7, Pots and Anatomy, another excellent chapter. Chapter 8, Roots, Growth, Rhythm, and Balance. Um, chapter 9, Attention to Details. Um, basically, in this chapter, he talks about uh, feats, feats, feet, and um, rims, edges, spouts, and knobs. Chapter 10. Um, pots for eating from, chapter 11, pots from drinking from, pots for storage, chapter 12, 13, pots for pouring. So you can see on through, and all together, I'm not going to read them all to save time, there's 17 chapters. And um, chapter 17 ends with um, technical requirements. Simplified technology for the Studio Potter. So this book was an excellent book. And um, I really enjoyed reading this. And probably one of my favorite chapters, I'm going to just read a section of this, so bear with me. It's on the uh, idea of function and it goes through the body parts. Pots and anatomy. And he talks about li uh, mouths, lips, noses, fingers, hands, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Functional pottery is made for people to use. This is on page 103. Functional pottery is made for people to use. Many potters feel that the pot isn't complete until it's physically used for its job. If it is to do this job totally, it should be efficient, easy to use, comfortable in the hands, and give pleasure to the user at the same time. One would consider how it was to be used and what parts of the human anatomy will be in contact with it for the optimum satisfaction on all counts. Judging by the by a large volume of pottery that one finds in the marketplace, a great number of potters and pottery manufacturers seldom consider the anatomy of the user when making their wares. So that's on page 103, at the beginning of chapter 7, and he goes into um, the anatomy, the human anatomy, and how pots relate to it. So that is excellent. And lastly, what I would like to do is 
read a little bit from the back and forth um, Bernard Leach wrote to the potter Warren McKenzie. And I really liked Warren McKenzie um, reading about him. I, I've never met him, um, but I've studied him. And I got his book, uh, Warren McKenzie, an American Potter, by David Lewis. And in the back, they have some critiques that Bernard Leach gave to Warren uh, because they were friends. Warren was an apprentice for Warren and his wife. Warren was an apprentice for Bernard Leach back in the day in the Leach pottery. And uh, they used to send each other pots. Well, Warren would send <laughs> Bernard pots, and Bernard would write back and comment on wh what he felt about the form and design of Warren's pots. So here's, here's one from uh, Bernard, uh, June 5th, 1965. Dear Warren, I received your two tea bowls about two weeks ago. I've seen your pots at Lucy's in Gwen's. I want you to know I know you want my reactions, so herewith. Shapes, feet especially, though easily and broadly made, don't quite ring any bell. Something seems lacking, a quality of life. They seem the school of Hamada in Japan. I cannot really find them in you. I don't mean Warren Mackenzie with two Zs either, but the inedible and particular stink trace that a good hunting dog would find in a blush, in a bush. How does one make a good s smell instead of no smell or a bad smell? By acting out with intuition and immediacy one's deepest desires. Desire creates. The taggers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Yours, Bernard. Get angry with me if you like, but don't get depressed by me. <laughs> so, in the book, um, there's quite a few of these letters and uh, back and forth by Bernard and Warren, which is really interesting. So, another good book on design. I got way back. It's the Potter's Dictionary of Shape and Form. Over 600 at a glance designs. But nothing's saying that you can't sit and think about proportion. Uh, this, what's, this what is what makes a, a sketchbook uh, come in handy. Um, you can sit and think about proportion and all those details and function, uh, what you want your work to say, symmetry, asymmetrical, uh, weight, all kinds of things. And tell your story in an intentional way on different types of forms that you can work out. And I think keeping a sketchbook or a project journal um, is a great idea. I keep one. And the one I talked about, a... Um, my pottery projects on Amazon are the ones I shared with you and I use that form. So if you care, go to Amazon and, and look that up. It's, it's, it's a small fee uh, just for doing it and getting it published, but I use that and on there I had little check boxes on different design elements that you can look. So form and function go together and and also I have learned that making good pots is like riding a bike you're you're gonna need to get the bad pots out of the way first right just like writers uh, they get rejected hundreds of times um, before they have good writing and you need to write so that you get the bad writing out of the way. You need the bike so you get the bad riding out of the way. And you need to make pots so you get the 
bad pots out of the way. And I have no idea what a bad pot might be, but you do. However, don't be too hard on yourself. And always remember that life is short. And as I said in the intro, we get to pick ourselves nowadays. We don't need to wait and be told if we're accepted or not, or if our work's good enough or not. It can start with one person enjoying what we do, and if it's safe and it functions in a safe way, and they find, and the user finds it enjoyable, and they are willing to give you money for it, or willing to enjoy it when you give it to them, then you're, you're in business already. So, well, all these standards and concepts and principles of design can be important to constructing your art and constructing your story that you want to intentionally tell and maybe build on through a series of pieces in a collection uh, are important. They're not 100% necessary all the time. However, they're good tools to have in your toolbox. If you ever want to repeat a thing, and sure, it's fine, probably making one-offs, and uh, however, if somebody else wanted a one-off, it seems you would want to repeat that again. And having some type of standard and design principles and design knowledge could help you do that. So, and, and with practice. Um, every day is practice. Every pot's practice. I'm practicing now. Things are drying down there. I still mess it up bad. And as I said before, I have no idea what a good pot is. And only a little bit about what it is not. So hopefully you enjoyed that. This whole thing could be a whole series on design and function. I need to think about that. Let me know what you think. Uh, come by the website. Say hello, creekroadpottery.com. Shoot me an email at creekroadpottery at gmail.com. And let me know if you enjoy the podcast. Feel free to like in whatever app that you listen to. It helps me out, right? Gets me higher in the algorithms to share it with other people who might enjoy what we all enjoy in making art and making pots so take care friends be well take care of yourselves and each other and happy potting <laughs>